We're looking at Genesis tonight, chapter 3. We're looking tonight at the dispensations. Last week we looked at the covenants. We talked about the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, the, the law, the Mosaic covenant. Tonight we're looking at dispensations, and this is a different, different theme altogether. The word dispensation means literally stewardship. In the Greek, it means stewardship. It's actually the ordering of events under divine authority. The ordering of events under divine authority. And we're going to look at seven or eight, as some believe, dispensations. And there are certainly at least seven, possibly eight. We'll look at these tonight. Each dispensation begins with an agreement and ends with a judgment. God never changes, but he does order events in our lives. And over time, we've seen God order different events for different people. God dealt with Israel different than the church. The law was different than grace. And we certainly see God work in a different way. Let's pray. God bless us as we take a look in your book for a walk in this ugly, cruel, wicked world. We thank you for what you've done in our lives for the fact that we are saved by grace and that you've not only forgiven, you forget, you've forgotten my sin. And I don't need to bring it up again. When I sin, I confess it, but my past is my past and I have to look forward. Keep my eyes on the Lord Jesus and never look back. Bless us now tonight as we take a look in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The first dispensation is a dispensation of innocence. It began with creation and ended with the fall and expulsion from the Garden of Eden. We know that God certainly dealt in, in, with man in a certain way at that time and certainly different than today. Because the dispensation of, of innocence was a, a, a perfect time, a perfect situation. Man had not sinned. And certainly God walked with them and talked with them. The fellowship had to be sweet. But when man sinned, that fellowship was broken. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Now we know there was creation and God made Adam and Eve and created all the animals and they were in this perfect garden. However, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made and said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. And that's where it all began. Causing doubt about what God has said. We live in a world today where people do not believe God's word. They don't believe what God has said. And as Bible-believing Christians, we need to believe it from cover to cover. In other words, don't question part of the Bible because you don't understand it. We won't understand it all in this life. There's things I've studied and studied and studied and I can't explain to you. I was asked a question the other night. When did, uh, when did the angels fall? When did God cast them down to earth? I don't know, but I know it was before the fall of man. We just don't know that. And I've given different theories on Wednesday night, but we don't know. But here in verse 1, here's, here's the devil. Look at verse 14. Same chapter. And the Lord God said unto the serpent. Now here's Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all beasts of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And then the curse is described here. He does so many things unto the woman. He said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow. In thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And the desire shall be to the husband, and he shall rule over thee. Rule over thee. That's part of the curse. Pain in childbearing and having a husband that rules over you. It's part of the curse. Then he said unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, thou hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. And he said, you're going to have to work hard, you know. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return into the ground. I mean, you're going to work every day. In the Old Testament law, they were commanded to work six days and then have a day off for rest. And he says, you're going to eat, you're going to live, and then you're going to go back into the ground. You're going to die. Of course, we know that part of the curse was physical death. Verse 24. Well, verse 21, it says, God, we just have to read this for the sake of theology, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. Why would God make them coats of skins? 
Because God had to teach them the importance of a blood sacrifice. They had sinned. And from here and forevermore until Jesus came, I shouldn't say forever, until Jesus came, they'd have to offer an offering for their sin. And when the law was given, they had to go on the, the Day of Atonement once a year and make an offering for all the people. But people had to make offerings. They had to take an animal and kill it to pay for their, their sin. And so they're now clothed in animal skins. They were clothed with fig leaves when they first sinned. Now they're stepping up to animal skins. And then we find here in uh, verse 24, and then we'll go over to chapter 4, verse 24. It says here, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east, at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, these are angelic beings, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of the life. So he blocked entrance into this place, turned everyone away. And now we don't believe that the Garden of Eden still exists after the flood. Certainly it changed. But God would not allow man to enter into that beautiful place anymore. So here's the, here's the dispensation of innocence, beginning with perfection. And ending with the fall of man, the sin, and expulsion from the garden. What a tragedy. And then we have a new dispensation, the dispensation of conscience, starting in chapter 4 and verse 1. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now this time of innocence, drop over to verse uh, chapter, uh, this, this, this goes from chapter 4, verse 1, through chapter 8, verse 19. But go to chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. This dispensation started with civilization all over again. Now, fill the earth and uh, all that, and we know that Cain was born, and, and uh, their children, and, and, and the earth began to fill in chapter 6, verse 6, we know that God is angry now at this time. Years have gone by, hundreds of years, thousands of years, and God's angry because the earth is full of people and they're all wicked. Look at chapter 6 and verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So here God's very disappointed. Now the word repent doesn't mean God had to Repent of his sin, God never sins. It's a word that means to change your mind. When we teach and preach repentance, we talk about how we need to repent to be saved. We need to admit we're sinners and realize we need to change and trust God to change us. Do you know you can't change yourself? Only God can change you. As a young man, I remember I was able to uh, control a lot of things in my life with, because I was young, healthy, and alert. And I wouldn't often say things and do things I shouldn't. I, I mean, as a real young man, I did it all wrong. But as I matured in Christ, I began to live a life, and I was able to, in my flesh, impress people into thinking I was a good person. Then as you get older and more stress comes in your life, more trials, all of a sudden you can't handle in the flesh anymore. You start to realize, you know, I, I now get mad and say things or think things, and I've got to depend more on God. And I remember uh, an older fellow I knew that just could not control his anger in his mouth as he got older, and he had to get right with God because he could not control his tongue anymore. Isn't that something? That the older we get, our tabernacle gets weaker, and we need to depend on God more and more. Don't think for a minute as you get older, you're not going to have temptations and frustrations. The other day I hurt myself, I was running in the house, moving too quickly in the dark, and I kicked something. And what do you think the first thought that came to my mind was from the devil? I didn't say it, but he put words on my mind. Say those old words. And I was so thankful I was prayed up at the time I didn't say them. I had to tell him to take a hike. But we, we can't live for God in the flesh. There comes a point in a time where we realize our flesh just cannot live for God. We're broken people. And I need so much to depend on the Lord. But anyway, here, verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. God changed his mind about mankind and realized we needed a do-over. <laughs> and he wiped mankind out. And, you know, we have a lot of debate today on how old the earth is. And we're not going to get into a lot of that tonight. In fact, not any of it except to say this. When the ark rested on Mount Ararat, 
and mankind went and all the animals were released. There's certain animals that didn't survive, and I believe the dinosaurs ended right there. I believe the weather was too difficult for them, and they died, and there was no longer a canopy around the earth. Remember, it had never rained up to the point of the flood. All of a sudden, rain, and the people who scoffed at the ark were looking up, wondering where this, is this water coming from, and God sent the first rains. And the earth flooded, and everything that wasn't on the ark died off. And we find fossil remains in the Mount Ararat area. And of course, it's amazing to me because we have this so-called evolutionary theory and the Big Bang and all that, and they have found human footprints in the same layer of the earth as dinosaur footprints. So dinosaurs aren't billions of years old. They're the same as man. They were created the same time as man by the Lord. And they were on the ark. You say, were they adults? They didn't have to be adults, two of every kind. And so we know that uh, God was angry here. And all the way through chapter 8, verse 19, we have this dispensation of conscience. Man knew sin, he knew right from wrong. And this time was 1,656 years of time, we believe, from creation to the flood. 1,656 times. 1,566, 1,500, uh, finally, 1,656 years. I've got to slow down. Third, we're going to go to chapter 9. Chapter 9. The third dispensation is the dispensation of authority or human government. This began from Noah's exit to, of the ark, the ark, the exit from the ark, all the way until the confusion at Babel and the tongues. And I say tongues, languages, that's what the word tongues actually means. It's in the Greek grammar, it's dialect in the New Testament, or glossae for glossary. There's no such thing as, as anything other than known words and known language. And so... Here, that he confused them with all these languages. These people in the Tower of Babel, they were trying to build an ark and trying to get to heaven, and God stepped in, and he confused them. So it began with authority or human government in chapter 9, verse 1. It actually begins in 820 and goes through chapter 11. We're going to look at chapter 9. It started with Noah's exit to the confusion of tongues and the death of Terah. Chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. I have two sisters, one with nine kids and one with seven. I told them, God didn't expect you to fill the earth all by yourselves. Uh, they're great girls, my sisters. In fact, I talked this morning about God moving our family. And six, my six siblings all met their spouses in Lansing. You know, the, the, the desert's what I looked at it as. And, and God brought them Christian, wonderful Christians. I have four brother-in-laws, and I'm not joking when I say this. Four of the finest Christian men I know are my four brother-in-laws. Really. And we've had family discussions, the brothers and I, over uh, how godly they are. My sister, who went to be with the Lord of Cancer at 56, her husband, Wayne, is the godliest man. His daughter's in mission work. His kids are solid. I just admire him so much. I've always looked up to him and admired him. And my brother-in-law, Carl, has Bible studies in his home and active in church, has gone on missions trips. And uh, that's my other brother-in-law. Another brother-in-law of mine is a missionary in uh, Perm, Russia. And then uh, my, my sister, uh, Diane, <laughs> I have four sisters, got to get the names right. Uh, Becky's husband, Silvio, is such a godly man. My brother-in-law, Bob, said, my brother Bob, excuse me, said, Silvio's the godliest man I've ever known. And I, I said, well, I, I don't know. I, I think Carl's awfully godly. And my other brother jumped in and said, wait a minute now. Bill's on the mission field, and Wayne's godly. That's the kind of brother-in-laws I have. I'm so thankful. And, uh, but they don't have to fill the earth all by themselves. Uh, anyway, chapter 9, verse 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, <clears throat> even as the green herb that I have given you all things. You know, I kind of like this because I can eat pork. <laughs> can eat catfish. You know, under the law... The law would come later, but now they could eat all the creatures. But under the law, did you know shrimp, and lobster, and uh, catfish, and pork, and chicken, all those things you couldn't eat. Think of that. We're so blessed to have all these things, and we're no longer under the law. But under the law, you couldn't eat all the things I just mentioned. So here it says, every living thing shall be meat for you. Verse 4, but the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. Don't eat living flesh. Cook it, eat it, enjoy it. Verse 7. 
And ye shall be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in all the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, <clears throat> behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So now he's going to establish a covenant. We talked about the covenants already. But here is the dispensation of authority or human government. We're not going to look at much more than that, but you know all about the Tower of Babel. How they had built a tower to reach heaven. And that would anger God. And what did God do? He sent confusion. Confusion. And they couldn't communicate and finish the work. Of course, the work was appalling to God anyway. And we're not going to turn to specific verses, but the next dispensation is the dispensation of the law. So after tongues and all the confusion, Moses is, comes along and leads the people out of Egypt. And, and we know that some people look at another dispensation called the dispensation of promise. They believe that lasts from the call of Abraham to the Exodus. But most scholars don't believe there's another promise. That's another, um, that's, excuse me, that that is another dispensation. Most say that falls within the confines of the law because, you know, Abraham did live by the law and, and, and lived, his generations of people lived long after the law and lived under the law. But anyway, the law began after the, the confusion of tongues and it ended in 70 A.D. with the destruction of Jerusalem. But what brought the law to an end was another judgment. And this judgment was a judgment of innocence. Jesus Christ went to the cross, 32 A.D., and shed his blood. And he was judged. We sang about the old rugged cross and the suffering and the shame. And we really forget that when Jesus Christ hung there, he had become sin for us. And God looked at him and was had to turn his back on him. And that's what that means. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God forsook him, turned his back on him. Why? Because it was sin. And Jesus didn't just bear the sin of the world. He bore the shame of the world. The embarrassment when we do something wrong, he bore that. We don't have to be ashamed. After we're saved, thank God, the shame's gone. We just trust in him. God looks at me. He does not see all my stupidity. He doesn't see my past. He doesn't see any of that. He sees that I'm a child of God. And in his eyes, I'm a saint. In your eyes, I'm not. But in his eyes, I am. I'm in him. I'm a saint of God. I'm righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, every day I battle the old nature, the old depraved mind, and depraved heart and the darkened mind and all that stuff. I battle every day. The Bible said our heart is desperately wicked. I battle that stuff every day. But isn't it something the moment I confess something, it's gone? God doesn't see it anymore. He only sees my present unconfessed sin. The moment I confess it, it's gone. And so under the law, it was difficult because Christ hadn't died yet. And so this dispensation of the law ends with, in 70 A.D. And then, of course, we have the dispensation of the church. As we break down our Bible, we have to understand the different categories of our Bible. We, we go through the Pentateuch, the law, and then we have the historical books, and then we have the prophets, and we have the songs, the psalms, and the, the, the other poetic writings we have. And then we have the major and minor prophets. And then we get in the New Testament, we have the Gospels. The Gospels cover the history of the life of Christ. Then we have the church epistles beginning with Romans and going through Revelation. But in between the Gospels and Romans, we have a little bridge book called the book of Acts. That's a book that connects two dispensations, the law and grace. Never build church doctrine out of the book of Acts. You can have some good reinforcement of Bible doctrines and use those verses for it. But Acts is not a New Testament church book. It's a bridge book connecting two Time periods. In fact, if you study Acts, you see they still go to the synagogue and churches are being established. They're still going to the synagogue to preach and they're kicked out and they're establishing churches. It's a bridge. So both these things are happening. We still see the apostles raising dead people. We don't see anyone raising dead people today. We see some of these things happening in the, in the time of Acts. Uh, but, but we know that Acts bridges the Gospels and the Epistles. Romans is the first church epistle. Romans to Revelation are all written to the churches. And there's a few personal books in there as well. Personal book to like, you know, Paul writes Philemon. 
about the runaway slave, you know, Onesimus and, and the epistles of John, and there's different books. But those are the church books. And that's where we build church doctrine. Now, when I, when I preach like that, sometimes people are confused. You say, Pastor, we, we sometimes have services where people come up and you anoint them with oil and you pray for healing. Does God still heal? heal? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're, we're not saying that now. God can do anything but fail. God still works miracles. We don't see a lot of manifestations of things like Elijah and Elisha we're able to see. We don't, we don't see dead people raised. We don't see an ax head floating. We don't see the sun stand still for several days. Can God still do any of that? Of course. Of course, because he's God. He still heals. And we're still thankful for the fact that he's still God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He dealt differently with the children of Israel than he does maybe with us today. But we know he's still God and he's never changed. So the, the next dispensation, of course, is the dispensation of the church. And we know it ends, it ends with the tribulation period. The rapture is a great thing. But let me tell you this, this church age is only going to get worse. The Bible said men will wax worse and worse. People are getting worse all the time. You just can't help but see all the evil around you. I mean, it's just scary for me to see it. I mean, I, I actually, you absolutely hate watching the news when I know it's going to be all negative and stuff I can't stand, I have to just change the channel. Saturday night, I, I can't hardly watch the news. I'll watch a little and get caught up, but I can't, I'll be all upset and I'll preach politics every Sunday morning if I'm watching the news. I have to stay in this book, you know, because I know I'm going to stand before you. And if I just talk about all the negative things, it's going to make you depressed and me depressed. And we're going to leave here like zombies, like we have no hope. And so we, we realize that God's sovereign. The world is getting worse and worse. All the perversion and stuff. Every Sunday I could preach about all the perversion and you'd all say amen to it. I mean, I know you'd say amen if I talked about a man swimmer swimming on a girl's team breaking all the records. That irritates the daylights out of me. I'd like to go hit that girl, they call her. It's a man, it's not a girl. God made him a man. But see... You know, I just can't let that stuff dominate my life because I have to be encouraging as well. And we don't always have to preach the negative. Sometimes we need to preach about the positive. Jesus is coming back. Amen. And this place is going to get bad and worse and worse. It's going to be so bad when the church raptures. It won't be a big shock as a tribulation ushers in because it's so evil, the world's not even going to see the transition. They're going to say, what happened to all these people? Because in one one hundredth of a second, we're disappearing. They're not going to watch us go up. It's not what the Bible teaches. We're gone. I can't snap my finger. I can't blink my eye. It's the twinkling of an eye. One one hundredth of a second. They will not see us disappear. Think of that. And with the way the world's going to be, it's just a natural transition to get uh, get worse and worse and worse. And that is what we call the tribulation period. That's the next judgment that's taking place. And so that lasts for seven years. What's the purpose of the tribulation? To get the Jews on their knees. That's the purpose. Jews need to be saved. And that tribulation period, God will deal with them. Now what's going to happen in the tribulation period? Joel tells us there's going to be strange things happen in the planets in space. I mean, think of that. All the things. The Bible says that people in the tribulation period who are looking for the Lord and become saved in there, because a lot of people are going to get saved. They're going to start reading their Bible and they're going to start looking for Jesus coming back and say, wait a minute. Everyone disappeared. All these people I knew were gone. And now all these terrible things, and my Bible says seven years, and they're going to begin to look. The Bible said no man's going to know the day nor the hour, but they're going to start to look. They're going to see strange things happen. But think of the 21 judgments. Think of the 21 judges. Read those in the book of Revelation. Maybe one time I'll preach those three sets of seven. Terrible, terrible judgments. And the last task called the Great Tribulation is really going to be bad. Global warming, absolutely. The sun's going to scorch men. Do I worry about it? No, I'm raptured before it happens. If they make me drive an electric car, I'll have to drive one. But, you know, all these things are going to come to pass. The sun's going to scorch men. 
wars and diseases and everyone's going to be broke and there's not going to be enough food in the world to feed everyone and Americans will suffer in famine as much as anyone else in the world. Why? Globalism, this one world government stuff. The person on the other side of the world and a heathen nation is going to get as much food as the people in America. But remember, we're raptured. We're gone. But that's how the church age will end. How will the tribulation period end, Pastor? The seven years will end with a, a worse judgment than the seven years. See, the tribulation period itself is a judgment at the end of the church age. What's the judgment, Pastor, at the end of the tribulation period? It's called the Battle of Armageddon. That Valley of Megiddo, Napoleon said that's the most ideal place for a battle to take place in the world. And the Bible says that battle will be so bad the blood will be to the horse's bridles. Blood six feet deep, seven feet deep maybe. Bodies and, and all the vultures of the world will gather there to eat all that flesh. And vultures will be there for the big feast. What a judgment. You see, all the armies of the world are going to turn against Jesus, turn against Israel, excuse me, and, and they're going to destroy Israel. Israel got all the minerals. They've got all the vegetables. They've got the oil, the minerals. They have everything. And everybody's going to want those things, and they're all going to converge on Israel. And just before Israel's wiped off the face of the map, Jesus steps in. He defeats them all by just speaking. You see, he has the armies of angels and millions and millions. He doesn't need any help, but he'll just speak and it'll happen. And then we have the wonderful millennium. The final dispensation is a millennial kingdom. A thousand years on this earth with perfect, perfect rule. Then what's the judgment at the end, Pastor? It's called the great white throne. The Bible says the sea will give up her dead. Death and hell will, will empty out their dead and everyone will stand before the Lord and give an account for their sin because they weren't saved. And they'll all be cast in the eternal lake of fire and then God's going to wipe the tears from our eyes. Scary to think about that. Why? We're witnessing the great white throne judgment. Do you think that's going to be a good experience, that judgment? Of course, for those sent to hell, we don't have to even talk about how horrible hell is, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and the fire that, you know, never stops. But think about us believers having to witness people cast into hell who we live next to and work next to, family members and relatives. Even your enemy, you'll have pity for them because you're already changed at the rapture. You're going to have a heart of compassion and you're going to see people that maybe you hated Never thought to witness to be thrown into hell. What's that going to be like? Well, God has to wipe the tears from our eyes. Evidently, we won't be able to stop crying after that great event, or tragic event, I should say. So these are our dispensations. And I know in two weeks we can't possibly cover those thoroughly. But you get an idea, and uh, we'll be preaching about dispensations. We're always in one of them, no matter where we are in the Bible. We're preaching about something that happened in a dispensation and we're going to, of course, on Sunday mornings, be in Ruth for a few weeks. We're going to go through the book entirely. Be praying for me that uh, each week it'll speak to your hearts. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we know you're so good. Yet you have to deal with mankind. And you've had to deal with mankind so many times. So many judgments and so many times where you've had to change things because we do not cooperate because of our sin. God, thank you for the church age, the cross of Calvary. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that we'll be raptured out. We're, we're, not destined, we're not destined to wrath. We're not children of wrath. And thank you, God, for the blessing of the rapture. Bless now and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.